As many know, you're the, uh, the chair of the House Republican Caucus, uh, so you get to have all the conversations, the easy ones and the not so easy ones. Um, the 2019 session seemed to be more temperate than the 2017 session in terms of a number of social uh, policy areas. Uh, certainly the Senate was less ambitious in terms of social issues. Um, how would you characterize the nature of the House Republicans? Are they moderating? Is that a trend we see in the House caucus? Or is that not, is that a misplaced adjective that it's just more focused on specific topics? How would you sort of describe the trend of your members in the House Republican caucus? I would say this past session that the emphasis was on property tax reform and school finance reform. Uh, that that is something that we had been working on for a number of sessions and did not quite cross the finish line and that there was an interest in tackling some of those great big issues. Mm -hmm. and, and not on some of the social issues. Yeah, th those were not the issues uh, in the forefront. We were all hearing back home that people's property taxes had gone up greatly and that people were concerned about being able to continue to afford their homes. Yeah. And, you know, the public kind of drove that discussion as far as school finance and property tax reform. So, Senator, in your caucus, the Senate Democratic Caucus, how does health care play? Is it a motivating issue for your members? I know there's a diversity of perspectives on this, but generally speaking, is it a, a first order policy area that the caucus is chomping at the bit to address? Or is it just, uh, is there no uniformity amongst the members as a whole? I, I don't think there's a single member of the Democratic caucus who doesn't recognize the urgency of the health care crisis we're facing in Texas right now. I don't think there's a single member in either party that doesn't recognize the urgency of the health care crisis. Uh, and while we do have Republican caucuses and Democratic caucuses, I don't, I don't think that health care should be just a caucus issue. Uh, but you can bet every Democrat is going to support some major advances in health care along the lines of what we saw last legislative session with respect to school finance reform. Uh, that didn't that wound up not being partisan. It wound up being just an issue that had to get addressed. Mm -hmm. uh, the voters demanded it. I think we're heading into a legislative cycle right now in a legislative session when the voters are going to demand action on health care. Uh, so the Democratic caucus and the Republican caucus are going to have to find ways to work together to solve this problem. Is 2021 going to be a health care session? I think so. Yeah. What, what, are the, what are the topics that you think are going to get teed up? In There's all sorts of uh, extremely important topics uh, that at, at the end are peripheral to, I think, the most fundamental thing and that is expansion of coverage of health care, which in 37 states is called Medicaid expansion. Uh, people in Texas, I think, are, are very concerned about using that word because it, it conjures up uh, bad memories of difficult legislative experiences. And the public itself in Texas has uh, been subjected to, I think, a lot of false concerns and un. Um, unsubstantiated fears about what that means. Mm -hmm. So the conversation that needs to happen out here in the field is to make sure that every legislator and every constituent and every business organization understands what we're really talking about when we're saying expand coverage. You may not want to call it Medicaid expansion. We're going to increase the number of people who are eligible for health care under the Affordable Care Act or a new block grant uh, through the uh, Section 1115 waivers as recently proposed by the Trump administration up to 138 percent of the federal poverty level. It's a lot of words. Mm -hmm. A nice shorthand is Medicaid expansion, coverage augmentation, call it what you want. But that's the fundamental thing that we've got to do because we've got a million and a half Texans that can be picked up and get health care coverage. I think personally, that, and, I, and I've done a lot of work on this, that we can deliver better care to more people for lower costs, create jobs, and do it on a revenue net neutral basis to the state at worst. So Representative Click, I want to come back to health care and follow up on what Senator Johnson said, but I'm reminded of uh, this wise old legislator who will remain nameless who would tell me from time to time, I guess he maybe would forget that he would tell me this, but he'd say, don't believe what you hear. The problem is not with the other party. The, this was a House member. 
The problem is not with the other party. The problem is with the Senate. Uh, how would you just give us an inside glimpse into the, the, the bicameral relations? The, how, how are the chambers getting along? And if the House, which has had some innovative proposals related to extension and, and, and coverage, uh, filling some coverage gaps, um, they have not always been well received in the Senate. How are those relations between the two chambers uh, in 1919 or 2019? Yeah, this last session, I think that there was a lot of collaboration across chambers and a lot of the prior uh, tension between the two chambers uh, didn't really exist. I mean, yeah. there was a lot of collaboration cross chamber. Uh, and I think that that's why we had a very successful session in getting some complex issues across the finish line. And can we make a guess about whether that will continue in 2021 or do we really have to see what the elections do? You know, I really think we're going to have to see uh, what happens election wise. You know, quite frankly, we're not even sure who the members are going to be. Yeah. Yeah. Particularly in the House, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, DJ and, and Representative Click, I wonder if you'll agree. Um, I do think the House and the Senate were able to work together to achieve some pretty major things, surprise building legislation among them. But also that tension between the two bodies, I think wound up being useful. Because I think we may have seen some flawed legislation come out of each each of those two bodies get forced into a conference committee, and and in this session, in my view, several of them came out better than either house would have done by itself. Mm -hmm. So, Representative Click, um, what is, what is how the what are the politics of health policy and the politics of healthcare like from where you sit, heading into an election cycle, working with your caucus? Are they poisoned by the national uh, vitriol? Uh, or do you feel like that there's quite a bit of room for conversations ranging from the bad word of expansion to the bad word of block grant? You know, it, uh, we operate very differently than they do in DC. You see members of Congress uh, sitting on separate sides of the chamber. Uh, that is not the case uh, in the Texas legislature. Uh, I've had Democrat uh, desk mates uh, we have an opportunity, due to the close proximity, to get to know members across the aisle. Uh, and surprisingly, uh, that helps you to be able to collaborate, sometimes cross aisle, on a variety of issues. Yeah. So it's a very different environment. Um, you know, there are very few people in both chambers that work in the healthcare space. Uh, and You're one of them. I, I, I am one of them. Uh, that is true. But I also have a responsibility because a number of my colleagues that do not have a health care background will rely on me to answer questions that they may have about a particular proposal. And what does this really mean? You know, we have so few health care background folks in the legislature but yet it makes up a significant part of our budget. Mm -hmm. uh, and so those that do have that background, we frequently are called upon to share our expertise and have discussions with other members to explain the process. Yeah. Senator, you talked about the, the way that coverage expansion would be received versus Medicaid expansion. Likewise, I think if we said uh, it, Texas could adopt a policy that provided flexibility for benefits that could help control cost trend in the future that would allow for innovative approaches to improve quality outcomes and uh, cost savings in terms of financing and could uh, add uh, coverage for adults, low income members of Texas, uh, the Texas community. So a number of people would say, okay, I, you know, and we could do it at low cost for, to the state um, responsibility. A lot of people would say, okay, that, that, that sounds pretty good, particularly Democrats. Uh, and then if you said we could have a block grant, a lot of Democrats would say, no way, even though it's, it could be the same thing. What do, what do you think about block grants? And is that flexibility a roadmap for where Texas ought to head? I think it's a, a whole new element of the conversation. The flexibility itself is not unique to the block grant proposal. The flexibility has been, uh, in fact, the, the flexibility that's attached to the block grant proposal has been handpicked from 
uh, 1115 waivers that states around the country have used, uh, a lot of these are measures that were advocated by Republicans or conservatives, and they work really well, and they've been picked up and added to the block grants. Some of them don't work so well and ought to be left behind. Um, but there's no reason they have to be stitched to a block grant. I don't think block grant is the best model for Texas to expand Medicaid coverage to um, the people who aren't current, the adult population that currently tragically is not receiving it. But if someone else does, and they want to extend coverage to another million and a half people in a way that I consider imperfect, I'm really delighted to have that conversation right now. My preferred method would be to take those uh, innovation facilitating, flexibility, reduction of red tape kind of measures and pair them with uh, a more traditional, we didn't used to say a traditional 1115 waiver, it used to be a traditional expansion and then 1115 waiver, so now we've got the third layer, but I'd like to, to use the experience of the other states, Democrat, Republican controlled, I don't care, let's find out what's working. We've got a lot of evidence, we've got six years of this in effect right now. What's working, what's not, and attach it to a straight up expansion under an 1115 waiver in a way that we can use those mechanisms to tailor the program to work for Texas. Because after all, we got 28 million people here. Our population is different than anyone else. So the, the conservative concerns that you know, what may work here may not work there are, are legitimate. But we now have the benefit of looking back in hindsight together with the flexibility being offered to us by Washington by the Trump administration, it's, it's a clear message that we are getting from Washington right now that they want us to cover more people under a block grant that looks a heck of a lot like Medicaid expansion. So there are, you know, the devil's in the details and there's a wide range of what block grants could look like. But if we sort of sketched a model that said, uh, there was an offer on the table between Texas and the federal government that had a fixed cost trend of maybe 2%, you know, even maybe below inflation or maybe 3%, certainly below medical inflation of say six, seven, eight percent but two or 3%, fixed trend over time. Wasn't capped on a per capita basis, so as population grows, the, 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 the funds coming to the state would grow, there'd be increased flexibility and that it would cover the adult beneficiaries. So essentially Medicaid expansion plus flexibility, but a fixed cost trend well below Medicaid uh, a medical inflation. Senator, is that a deal that you would take? It's not the first deal I would take, but late May, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Representative, would, would that be a deal that you would take? No, my big concern is we still have over 100,000 people on a waiting list for services in the IDD community. And those are vulnerable populations that uh, some of them have been on waiting lists for more than a decade. I would say that population has been waiting in line for a long time. Which population? It's the IDD community that have been on the interest list for many, many years uh, for services. Uh, there's over 100,000 of them. Yeah. Uh, people. You, sorry to interrupt, go ahead. That those folks have been waiting for a long time. They, we need to take care of those folks first. You had told me about that earlier today. I hadn't heard that before. Tell me, and you know, th there's so many things I don't know anything about and IDD I am weak on, um, candidly. So tell me about that population. Uh, what's, wh what's happening there? Why is that list so long? They're uh, individuals with intellectual and developmental yeah. disabilities. Uh, there uh, is a limit uh, to services. You know, we have a number of state-supported living centers yeah. uh, in the state. It's far more cost-effective for that care to be provided in the community versus in an institutional setting. And you know, we are a state that our institutions, the census is declining uh, in that, uh, but we've got folks that would like to have services in the community, but they've been on a waiting list for years mm -hmm. uh, to be able to get that. Care in the community is significantly less expensive. Yeah. How would you, Representative, how would you prioritize the topics? I think we, what you've just said is, look, that conversation about block grants and expansion aside, there are other priorities for you. How would you sort of, like what are the priorities on the table, do you think, in terms of 
healthcare and health policy in 2021? What are the sort of various moving parts that we might see? I think two of the biggest issues that we have are access to care and affordability of that care. And I think one of the things that I will be working on next session to improve that is occupational licensing reform. You know, Texas has one of the most restrictive professional healthcare licensing uh, statutes in the country. Uh, we have other states, for an example, nurse practitioners. Uh, state of New Mexico is appropriating money to come and recruit Texas nurse practitioners uh, because they have a more favorable practice environment than we do here in Texas. Uh, another example is dental hygienist. In Texas, they are not allowed to do local anesthesia. 45 other states allow them to do what they were trained to do, but we don't here in Texas. You know, we're a growing state. We have populations that are medically underserved that need access to quality professionals, and we need to remove these barriers and let these professionals do what it is that they're trained to do and take care of patients. So Senator, that's an interesting, I think a useful insight on the provider side of the equation. When you think about the payer side of the equation, uh, Senator, how, wh how would you characterize the state of the managed care accountability conversation holding as a state, recognizing there are different agencies and the branches of government and all that good stuff, but as a state, where should the conversation be in the next 12 months around improved accountability for managed care organizations and the managed care system? It, it's, uh, it's a work in progress. Um, I think it was hoped that the managed care organization system would deliver these instantaneous solutions and our, our costs would collapse and our care would be perfect, uh, which was overambitious. But I, it's also the consensus out there, convincing consensus, that it is a better model uh, that's incentivizing things in the right direction. Uh, there's all sorts of opportunities, whether when you're talking about block grants or, or Medicaid expansion, where we're doing most of the managed care organizations to achieve better results and have some cost sharing. And even one of the most attractive uh, variants on the block grant and some of the other uh, 1115 waivers that relates to MCOs is that it's going to allow some flexibility in the use of the funding to maybe redirect some money away from acute health care towards health before it becomes acute in ways that we can't under the current regulatory regime. Mm -hmm. So I think if we could move managed care towards addressing health as well as health care, we will see tremendous benefits both in terms of you know, quality of life for patients and costs to the state. Uh, I, I think there are a number of, of really good ideas and Representative Click and I are gonna be looking at a, at a lot of things that she's mentioned here and some others that we've talked about. Um, in the meantime, we haven't really addressed the crisis that we're facing, which is Texas is about to lose $12 billion in funding for our healthcare system because our current 1115 waiver expires. Whatever we're going to do, a block grant, uh, a straight up Medicaid expansion, expansion through an 1115 waiver, nothing, we ought to be talking about it be because our finances are going to change. $12 billion is actually real money. Even in an economy as big as Texas, we got a $248 billion budget, we got 82 million that goes to healthcare, we got only 25.6 billion of it goes to Medicaid, we're about to lose 12. Yeah. Meanwhile, we've got the, the MFAR regulations, the uh, Medicaid Fraud Accountability, which somebody's gonna help me with that acronym. Fiscal Accountability. Fiscal, yeah. fiscal yeah. Accountability yeah. Reform, which is essentially obliterating the, 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 the chewing gum and popsicle sticks with which we've held together our healthcare system for the past several years. We're in a very difficult spot, and, and I think we're gonna have to address those with some really big, bold initiatives, and that some of these other reforms, which are also very important, are not gonna get us there. We've gotta face the big questions. So, let me ask, unless I see anyone, some looks like one person's uh, got a question. I was gonna dig into the weeds on MFAR, which uh, gets me excited and puts half the room asleep. But, uh, <laughs> I, we do have a question over here, sir. We'll get you a microphone. Give us your name and your organization and ask away. Uh, Ken Yonda with Wild Blue Health Solutions in Houston. Uh, we talked a lot about coverage expansion, and I think coverage expansion is a good thing. Uh, but we didn't talk really about the fact that of those 5 million uninsured people in Texas, more than half of them are actually 
working for small businesses that don't offer health insurance or work for large businesses that they're not eligible for health insurance because they work part-time jobs or otherwise wouldn't be eligible for a Medicaid expansion. So are there opportunities through 1332 waivers or other innovations that we could actually talk about those sort of the working poor that I think everybody would agree we need to make sure that has good access to health care? Yes, I filed a 1332 bill last session. Uh, it didn't survive. It's actually going to take a little bit more work to get it done this session. I hope you'll help us do it. Yes, 1332s, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, uh, it's a waiver by which we can create a high-risk reinsurance pool, take some of the, the, the more risky, more expensive populations, put them into a single pool. The state works uh, with providers to provide a, a separate line of coverage for them so that commercial insurers who want to come into Texas aren't facing that risk and that cost. Um, a little more than half a dozen states around the nation have pursued 1332 waivers. It has resulted in commercial premiums coming down by somewhere between anywhere from 8% to 30%, depending on the state and how you, how you craft your program. It's not easy, it's very complex. Uh, but it, it's definitely something that we should be looking at so we can drive, bring in more insurers. The competition drives down rates. You know, it's one of those things where we can, we can steer market forces in a direction that serves the public as well as uh, being commercially viable to the businesses who come here. On this question about MFAR, um, so for folks that care not to read about CMS draft rules, uh, this, what, <laughs> effectively calls into question, and many would say imperil, imperils the, uh, the way that Texas funds some of its Medicaid program through intergovernmental transfers, often between local governments and then up to the state to then get a provider, or get a, a drawdown through FMAP uh, from the federal government, blah, blah, blah. I know about that. I don't know about IDD, but I know about that. Um, that, to your point, Senator, has been a key piece of not just the waiver and DISRIP, but a lot of funding of particularly local provider uh, uh, providers in Texas healthcare. Representative Click, if, if that were to go away, that's an example of something that would probably move very quickly. It would be very slow and then it would move very fast. So it would happen by rule, not by congressional action. And then Texas would sort of have this question of, if, if it's so great, this system that has been funded through federal dollars and drawdowns and IGTs, should we just fund it ourselves? And I don't think, my gut tells me Texas legislators would not rush <clears throat> to backfill funding cuts as a result of this MFAR rule. Is that a fair political assessment? I think that it is, but I also believe that other states are also uh, having a similar fate in all of this. Uh, you know, every few years, we uh, kind of tippy-toe up to the line and think that some of these programs are gonna go away and not be renewed. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not, uh, unwinding that takes time. Mm -hmm. And it requires some thought to do it properly. Um, so. It's reasonable to think, though, that the implications of this rule could be known by the 2021 session, uh, particularly if uh, President Trump is reelected. That would provide some continuity on this score, um, and that it would the consequence would fall someplace between the 2021 session and the 2023 session, requiring legislative act action in some way super hard to get in front of this rule where you don't know that it's gonna become right. finalized, you don't know what the federal government's gonna do. How do you as a citizen legislator try to forestall a, you know, a potential collapse of many providers in the state when there's no clarity about how to address this at all? Well, I know that there are discussions uh, between state officials and DC that are ongoing. Yeah, We need productive predictability as do some of those providers. Uh, and other states are also experiencing this. I think they're gonna have to find a way to lengthen that transition period so that states can fully consider what approach they wanna take. Yeah. Senator, what, what are your thoughts on, on how to pre prepare for a potential calamity that may never come or that might be a totally different shape than what we're talking about today? We don't even know what it's gonna look like in December 
you know, which, who will be in the White House? Yeah. And, and, and if it's a Democrat, will they agree with the new proposals, with MFAR? Uh, unlikely, but we don't know what's going to happen. And so, as you put, we're, we're trying to prepare for something. We don't know what's going to happen. My guess is it's going to wind up in litigation, tied up in the courts for months, years. So it, it, it's, uh, it's dangerous to hope for the avoidance of a calamity with the courts gumming up the system, but I'm pretty confident it's gonna be gummed up in the courts for a while. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a pretty audacious move. Uh, a lot of people think that uh, as a regulatory matter, you can't come in here and um, violate the right of states to um, supply this funding in accordance with the statute. So I think it's gonna wind up in the courts. In the meantime, um, I think that the catastrophe can be ameliorated by some form of partnering with the federal government to draw down Medicaid dollars at a 90-10 match. That will get rid of the need for some of our local participating provider type funding mechanisms that could be wiped out by NFAR, but not all of them. Not all of them. Uh, there's a lot of supplemental funding that we would still lose out on. In states that have expanded, they're still panicked about it because it would it will um, make it very difficult for them to do. Maybe there's some clever lawyers who can figure out a way to uh, create provider taxes, policy taxes um, that don't run afoul of either the law or these regulations that have come down. Um, there's a lot of clever lawyers in Texas. There's a... Uh a unique element of this is that California is also a heavily IGT funded state. The, uh, the attorney general there, Javier Becerra, only sues Republican administrations. Ken Paxton, of course, only sues Democratic <laughs> administrations. So you two, you two states together have your bases covered for whatever happens in November. Uh, you can be allies in that regard. Another question over here. Hi, Veronica Karam from Houston Methodist. Um, regarding supplemental payments and funds to the states, I want to make a PSA for the 2020 census uh, since there's so much federal drawdown that comes out of uh, our population and the census. Uh, so I actually had the Census Bureau reach out to me. I, being a hospital, you know, we have 26,000 employees, all of the clinicians, all of the patients. So I would just uh, encourage everyone to go back. Um, I was told that households will get mailings in March. Um, and then they actually now have an opportunity to fill out their form either by phone or online, which is brand new. Mm. But either way, just you know, hitting on point about the importance of uh, funding, it's Head Start, it's HUD housing, it's Medicaid, Medicare. So um, just to take that back to all of your institutions and for your constituents as well. Great, thank you. Yep, it, it raises another issue that um, Representative Click and I discussed yesterday. Uh, the head counts of various areas are going to affect federal funding, not just for health care. They're going to affect federal funding for things like infrastructure and transportation. And to some extent, uh, health care is a function of the kind of infrastructure that we can uh, that we can provide people. And we were talking yesterday about telehealth, for example. If you don't have broadband access, it's not gonna be much good for good to you. Mm -hmm. uh, and the census is going to affect that and the decisions we make next session are going to affect that. So yeah. everything's related. Read another question. Hi, uh, David Reynolds. I represent the Texas chapter of the American College of Physicians. Uh, I'd, the question I like to ask is, it's kind of a thousand foot overview question. We heard, er, uh, we heard earlier that, um, you know, the polling uh, reflects uh, on whether it's Democrats or, you know, likely Republican voters that border security is an issue and public ed, et cetera. You know, the, the legislature is going to, uh, legislators are going to file a, at least 7,000 bills, if not more. So where do y'all uh, view uh, the, the health care in, in the pecking order of all the issues that the legislature uh, will pick up and spend a lot of time uh, working to resolve or trying to. Representative, you want to take that first? I think, <clears throat> and I hear it all the time from my constituents, it, there are affordability issues. Uh, we passed some legislation last session dealing with the surprise medical bills. Uh, in fact, that legislation is likely to become the model for the nation. Uh, and that was in response 
to the public uh, being tired of having high uh, surprise medical bills. But, but there are other things regarding affordability that I think that we can do. Uh, we need to be very careful about not passing restrictions in the form of legislation that uh, would halt or stop or curtail some new models of care. Uh, example, my area, we, we talk about direct primary care, but in my area we have direct orthopedic care. Uh, there is a clinic, they're frequently open on the weekend, uh, so that if you've got a, a kid that plays basketball or baseball and gets an injury, they can bypass the ER and go to the, the direct ortho care clinic. Uh, we also are seeing uh, in my area a direct GI uh, approach for screening colonoscopies. And they're not gonna do insurance, it's cash. And it's significantly less than what a lot of other uh, providers would charge because they don't have to have the overhead of insurance, uh, the staff to, to process those claims. Significant savings. More and more uh, people have high deductible plans, which means some of the care they're going to be paying for out of pocket. Uh, and so we need accessibility, but also we need affordability. And I think that there are a number of things that we can do next session to help make there to be more transparency, more affordability, and more access. Senator, where does healthcare fit amongst the issues and priorities for Yeah, the, the, the question's a political one. Will, will we have the political momentum to do the kind of things that Representative Click's talking about, to do the kind of things that I'm talking about? <clears throat> it's gonna be a priority for me no matter what. Um, but I'd like it to be a priority for everybody, and that somewhat depends on the conversation over the next 10 months. I intend to do everything I can to make it a serious big political issue in the next election cycle. And I don't mean that in the politically aggressive way that it might sound. I'm not talking about necessarily flipping seats. We weren't necessarily talking about flipping seats when we addressed education. We were talking about an overwhelming message from voters that were concerned about property taxes and were concerned about education. It had always been, those had always, always been issues, but it had never been so loud and clear. How clear, your question is, how clear is it gonna be that among those 7,000 bills, and a lot of them are very important, just they don't get public airtime. Um, how clear is it gonna be that that is our mission next session? I hope it's very, very clear. Because there are people on, on the left who need the support. There are people on the right who need the cover. I mean, you gotta have a reason to pursue a controversial piece of legislation. And if there's an electoral reason for it, it moves along much faster. So to the extent anybody in this room can help your local Republican or Democratic legislator make it a priority, I think it's, it's, it's incumbent upon every one of us to make sure it is the issue next session because there's no bigger crisis we're facing financially or socially right now than our healthcare. I don't wanna be all gloom and doom. We really did achieve a great deal in the field of healthcare last session. I just think there's a, a, a colossal amount of work still to be done. Mm -hmm. Representative Click, there's, uh, we talked about this a little bit previously, there's a lot less energy, there's a lot less sort of intra-party aggression uh, in the primaries. Uh, Republicans are not sort of attacking one another with as much vigor as has been the case in previous primary elections, it seems to me. A, is that accurate? Uh, and B, you know, does that, does that position you all pretty well for the general election? I assume you're keeping your powder dry to be able to focus on, on November. Yeah, we have far fewer Republican primary contests uh, this cycle than what we've had in, gosh, probably the last decade. Mm -hmm. uh, I will say that our colleagues on the other side of the aisle do have more uh, contested primary elections this time than what they've typically had. But you know, our goal uh, is to uh, bring back our members and, and, and gain uh, the number of seats in our majority. Mm -hmm. Senator, what do you think the Texas Senate will look like come December 1st? What do you have? Uh, are there a couple of key races that you're keeping your eye on in terms of the future composition of the body? We're all uh, friends here. 
while I would prefer to be a member of the majority, I expect I will be a member of the minority come next legislative cycle. Um, I think there are a few races that might be in play. Uh, we may pick up a seat, two, three, I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't think the, the Senate is, uh, is likely to flip. I'm not a pundit, though. Um, I am. You have an opinion or two. I, pick up I, on it. I do have opinions. I just don't voice them all. Yeah. A, <laughs> Question, Rita? No? Um, do either of you think that, uh, Senator Johnson, any chance that Donald Trump will lose the uh, election here in Texas? Yeah. Oh, in, wait, wait a minute. In, that Donald Trump will lose the popular vote in Texas? In Texas. Yes, there is a chance. And would you put your mortgage on it? Uh, there's very few things I bet on. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't one of them, huh? Uh, it, is not, it is not one that I would bet on. Yeah. Alas. Rep Representative Click, I, I expect that you think that uh, Donald Trump will carry the state this November. I do. What do you think the chances are? I, I think that uh, the, the Cruz O'Rourke race caught a lot of people, got a, got a lot of attention. The performance of Democrats in the 2018 election got a lot of people's attention. Uh, what do you think about 2022? Are we, I know that's, God, that's like five lifetimes from now, but are we, do you expect that in 2022 there may, we may have a three more years of demographic or two more years of demographic change and some shifts that might suggest more Democrats are elected statewide in 2022? Yeah, I reject that notion. I spent some time helping a colleague down in House District 28 in Fort Bend County one of the most diverse uh, counties in the state. Uh, and he had a very diverse uh, group of supporters. And the message of economic opportunity, jobs, uh, which is a Republican message, uh, sold very solidly there. Uh, Beto O'Rourke was there, practically camped out, I'm told. Uh, during that time, uh, but yet our mar margins in that race were higher than what they had typically been. So uh, I, I, I'm very optimistic yeah. for Republicans. Yeah, I'm, I'm not as optimistic for Republicans, <laughs> actually. <laughs> that sounds like a pundit. See? <laughs> so uh, Representative Click, how can this group of folks here who you know have not yet had their uh, carbo crash uh, from lunch. How can they help you? Uh, politics aside, how can they help you and your caucus have a more constructive policy discussion in 2020 that leads to 2021 politics, elections? Not talking about that. I'm talking about how can they inform you in, the le in, in your work at the legislative level? One of the things that we are doing during this interim session is our policy committee for our caucus is continuing to meet. And if you have got a new innovative approach solution, uh, I would encourage you uh, to contact the caucus office and see if we can schedule you for an opportunity to do a presentation before the caucus uh, policy committee. I mean, we are already studying and teeing up, talking to stakeholder groups about potential legislation next session. And now is a great time. You know, this is something that we've done differently. In the past, we've not necessarily kept the policy committee active during the interim, but we are this time so that we will have uh, better policies uh, going into the next session. You know, a lot of the work for the next legislative session is done in the interim. Mm -hmm. And so those are great places to plug in uh, and help us craft the best policy for next session. Yeah, 2021 is happening now in many ways, right? Senator, how can this group help you in the work that you're doing at the legislature? I, I agree 100% with Representative Click said. Uh, our, we, we have some ideas, but most of what we do comes from the information we get from constituents, and in this case, we're not just talking about our average constituents, we're talking about people who really understand the sector that we're in right now. It's highly complex, the problems are huge. If you've got ideas, if you've got complaints less often, but, but bring them to us, and, and we're meeting every single week with multiple people uh, who have new ideas or have examples of things that aren't working or unintended consequences for something we passed last session. Just stay fully engaged, um, and also, 
don't write Texas off. I know there's a lot of frustration with how difficult it is on, on both sides. It, 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 people ask me all the time, what's your biggest surprise about being in the legislature? I'm surprised how hard it is to get the smallest thing done, and it can be dispiriting sometimes, but don't give up. I think we are on the verge of great progress in the healthcare field, and it will only come if everybody puts their weight behind it. So last question, building on that, uh, since it's just you know, us and a glass of wine, and we've been doing this for a couple of glasses of wine, I wanna know what you really think. Um, what advice would you give to this group? And I'll ask both of you this leadership question. As these organizations, or as these folks lead their organizations, not about helping you in the legislature, but about leading their, um, their entities, during this time of tremendous political chaos, we've got State of the Union tonight, we've got an impeachment vote tomorrow, we've got primary you know, for uh, the legislature here just around the corner, and then of course, we're gonna be inundated with TV ads and all of the hullabaloo of the 2020 election. As they try to lead their organizations through this political time of turmoil, what counsel would you give them, uh, Senator, first, about leading their organizations during this time of political tumult? I'm, I'm measuring my thoughts. Um, I think you might turn off the TV for a few days <laughs> and, um, and read something about local Texas politics and local Texas healthcare needs. Honestly, th there's so much uh, attention paid to the federal debate, which of course has important implications for what we do here in Texas. But I don't know if we could say the majority or the vast majority of, of what's gonna happen to people the way our healthcare systems function is gonna be a matter of what we're doing here at the state level. Uh, and it means that the conversations you have within your businesses and the conversations you have with your legislators and about, I mean, I'm only talking about politics, that's the thing I know up here. Um, I think we need to spend a little less time watching the entertainment of Washington DC and pay a little more attention to what we're doing right here. Representative? No, we in Texas, uh, as policymakers and lawmakers, function very different. Don't lose sight of that, uh, how we function versus how DC functions. But I also would say, going preparing for next session, that it's important to not assume a particular uh, member uh, or a particular party has a a, a bias on a particular issue, go and actually have conversations. You might be surprised. Uh, there are a lot of things that um, are non-controversial and that we do agree on. Mm -hmm. Good, well, both of you have been individually and personally engaged with state of reform uh, across multiple instances, multiple events, and in your case, multiple years in particular. And I just can't thank you enough about your personal engagement with us and the bipartisan and sort of intellectual zeal that you bring to these conversations. So let's give them a round of applause. Thank you very much for being here.